for this webinar, we are giving, getting a presentation from Catherine Grant on Family Search's Family Tree person page, and Catherine will be giving an introduction to that. Next webinar, and if you can see on the announcement page, I'll zoom in a bit here. The next webinar we have coming up in October is with Joe Everett. He is the head librarian at the Family History Library, and he's just going to be giving an overview of what's happening at the BYU Family History Library. So that'll be next Thursday, the 25th at 4 p.m. And if you wanted the recording of this webinar, that will be available shortly on our YouTube page and our website, most likely on Friday morning. If not Friday mornings, I always try to get the, the video posted on the YouTube and our website by Monday morning. Uh, if you have any questions uh, or any feedback on our new platform, you can email us at h fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu and any other information uh, would be on our website uh, which is right here on the announcements page. I'll turn the time over to Catherine and get started. Great. Thank you so much, Marin. And everybody, it's so good to have you with us. So I need to, I'm still getting used to this uh, new platform too, but we really do hope it will be an improvement. So I am going to try to share my webinar screen. Okay. I think uh, if anybody does not see the webinar screen, please enter it in the chat. And I'm sure that Marin will be able to uh, resolve whatever issues that we have. So folks, thank you so much for coming today to this webinar. We're so glad to have you with us. And as Marin mentioned, this is a webinar on the person page in Family Search Family Tree. So I wanted to comment at the beginning that this webinar will be a very high level overview of the person page. The purpose is basically to get you familiar with it. So if you are new to Family Search Family Tree, this could be a helpful introduction. Or if you teach other people, this could be helpful in you preparing lessons or maybe getting some ideas of what to say or so forth. But we're not going to get deep into the functionality. And so let's just take a look at what we will be covering today. First of all, we'll do an overview of the whole person page. And the person page actually recently got a facelift as of the date of this webinar, which is October 2018. So the person page has now been divided into five sub pages that you see listed here on the screen. And we'll do a quick overview of each of those sub pages. And then, since the details sub page is the one that people tend to use the most often, we'll go into a little bit more detail on that. And then we'll also point you to some additional resources for those areas that we're not going into a lot of detail about. So let's go ahead and dive in. First of all, I wanted to set some context to explain why a webinar like this might be helpful or why we want to know about the person page. And it has to do with the goal of Family Tree, which is to have one complete accurate record for each person who has lived on the earth linked to other records by correct relationships. Well, the person page is where we make that happen. So put another way, the person page is the place where we record all information about one specific person in Family Tree. I think it's fair to say that the person page or person pages are really the building blocks of Family Tree because if we didn't have the person pages, we couldn't have any of the tree views you know, the landscape or portrait or fan chart or whatever, there'd be nothing to put in them. And we also couldn't search for any information because there would be nothing to search for. So the person page is really vital, a vital part of Family Search's family tree, and that's why it's so important. So let's go ahead and look at the different parts of the person page. We'll start out with the header, which appears at the top of the page. And we'll go through just each of the little um, 
pieces, I guess you would say, of the header. So first of all, we've got the name. And if you're wondering where that name came from, especially if you see a mistake in it, that name is actually drawn from the name as it's entered in the vitals section. So that's the place where you would make a correction if a correction was needed. The lifespan is indicated right under the name. If there's an exact birth date, then it will be given there. And if there's not an exact date, for instance, you see on the death date, they just say deceased. So it will display basically whatever you've got in this vital section. So again, if you want that to display differently in the header, then make the changes to the vital section. The next component that we see is the PID or the person ID or sometimes called the ID number, although that's not quite accurate because it consists of both numbers and letters. But this is a unique identifier for this person. So we always know that if we search by MY92-1WQ, we're going to get John William Bescoby. Now a feature that they've added recently, which I really, really like, is that if you click on the PID, you get this little, uh, pop-up box that lets you copy that ID. Before they added that, you used to have to try to select it and then right click or do control copy and sometimes the select wouldn't select the whole thing or it would pop off just when you tried to copy it or whatever. And it was fr frankly a pretty big pain. So now if you just click it, you get this cool little copy box, you click the copy box and then it says ID copied and then you're able to paste that any place you need whether to a search or whether you're trying to look that person up for, uh, you know, adding that, that person as a parent or whatever. That's just a quick and easy way to copy the ID. So pretty cool. Next, I wanted to indicate how the sex of the person is shown or the gender. So there's three indications in the header of the person's sex or gender. The first is the little avatar here. So if the person doesn't have a portrait, well, if they have a portrait, you can kind of see from the portrait what uh, sex they are. But if they don't, then the avatar here shows a little short-haired guy for the male and a blue dot next to the name indicating again a male and then also a blue line under the header. For the female, they're all pink. Uh, well, except the, the avatar has little kind of flippy hair, so you realize that's a female. And then you also have a pink dot next to the name, and you have a pink line at the bottom of the header. So that's how you can tell the, the sex of the person at a glance. And we've got a couple or three actually options over here to the right side of the page. The first one is view tree and that is just a very quick way of seeing the person whose page you're on in their tree view. So you notice when I click tree or view tree, we got over here and John William Bescoby is shown in the center of the tree with his wife and his children are shown off to the left hand side and his ancestors and his wife's ancestors are shown off to the right. So when I've seen what I want to see on this page, I can easily get back to John's page by clicking person and it takes me right back to his page. The next item of interest here is the watch feature. So if I want to watch somebody, I click watch and you notice that the star turns dark and the option changes to unwatch. What this does is every time somebody, any other user makes a change to this page, I will get an email. And there is actually a whole webinar on the watch feature, so we'll won't, we won't go into a lot of detail, but just know that it's really useful, especially on uh, people that maybe tend to get a lot of wrong changes to them, maybe a famous person or a close ancestor that you notice, maybe they were a, 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 a Utah pioneer and so they get changed a lot by people. So this feature is helpful for being notified of those changes 
If you want more detail, look up the BYU FHL webinar called Got My Eyes on You using the watch feature in Family Tree. And I believe I forgot to mention that at the end of this webinar, we're going to give a list of all these webinars. So you don't need to worry if you don't want to about writing all them down right now because they will be displayed on a page at the end. And when you're viewing this webinar later, then you can just go to that page and stop the recording and you'll be able to see all those links. And then also the slide deck will have those links be active. So you can actually click on them to go to this to the specific webinar okay the next one is view my relationship and I've got to admit this is one of my favorites I just think this is so cool so when you click view my relationship it actually pops up on the screen this visual of how you're related to the person so in this case I'm down here at the bottom and it shows that I go up to here to my common ancestor with John William Bescoby and then it shows the generations to get down to him. So I see how I'm related to him and I just, I don't know, that just makes me happy. I love to see those links and how we can say, okay, here's my parent and the grandparent and great grandparent and now here's your parent, and your great grandparent and so forth and see exactly how I'm related to this person. Another cool feature, there's two other cool features that I want to mention, and that is about setting portraits. So until a portrait is set for this person, you do see the generic avatar. But the way that you can um, change that, if anybody has added portraits, you or any other user has added portraits and they've been tagged to this person, then they will show up here. In this case, John William Bescoby doesn't have any portraits set to him. So the only thing I can do is select the avatar, which is already selected. So if I do select this, it's just going to say, hey, we've changed it, but they didn't really because it's just going to be this. So that's an example of if the the person does not have any people tagged to them in family tree. So if you have a photo and you want it to show up here, the solution is to tag that photo to family tree. And we won't go into detail about that, but you can actually look at the, the webinars on memories or you can look in the help center, the Family Search Help Center, on how to tag a photo to a person in family tree. Here's an example of somebody who does have a lot of photos tagged to her. This happens to be my grandmother, Minnie Hendricks, and so she's, a lot of people have added photos, and so because they've been tagged to her, they all show up in this, this uh, set your preferred photo, or set your preferred portrait box. And so if I didn't prefer this portrait, I could pick any of the other portraits here. One comment I wanted to make about that that you may be wondering about is what if I change the portrait does it change it for everybody and the answer to that is no the portrait is specific to you so if you change that portrait that's only going to show up for you and any other user can set their own portrait so that's that's a nice feature one other feature that I wanted to talk about is called labels the church has set up a number of labels, for instance, having to do with um, sports figures or writers and authors or Mormon pioneers or different things like that. If they knew a label to apply to somebody, then they added it automatically to the page. But if they didn't, there's a lot of labels in there that Family Search might not have known apply to your ancestor. So you can actually, if there's a label shown here, you can click on it to see all the other labels. But if it's not, if there's no label here, but you'd like to add one, we're going to show later on how you can do that. Okay, so that concludes the part about the header of the page. Oh, except one other thing I did want to mention is that that header shows up no matter what subpage you go to. So it's always available. That's, that's a nice feature that you can always get to these options no matter what subpage you're on.
So this red box right here shows the five subpages of the person page. We've got the details page, the timeline page, the sources page, the collaborate page, and also the memories page. And we're just going to talk briefly about each of these pages, but then we're going to go into more detail about the details page because that's the one that people tend to use the most often. I love this feature here that counts are shown for the sources, collaboration items, and memories. So in other words, I've got 16 sources attached to this person, zero collaboration, and zero memories. That's just a nice quick way of telling what you can expect to see on those subpages. So if I know there's no, like, I guess no memories, for instance, I know I don't need to go to that page to see any memories. The details page displays dates, places, and other facts such as military service or alternate names, uh, occupations is another thing. There's actually a whole list of other facts that you can add to a person in family tree and they are displayed on this details page. And then also the details page displays relationships. The timeline page I have fallen in love with. This is like the most amazing, amazing page. So it takes the information from the details page and displays it in a chronology on the left hand side of the page. You can show a map as I've shown here. You don't have to. If you want to turn the map off, you just come up here and slide the little slider over and then this area is just blank. Another very cool thing is that since this timeline uses Google Maps, you can actually go to the satellite view. So I can actually click an item over here in the timeline and then click satellite and I can see a picture of that as long as Google Satellite has it in their database. Now granted, of course, these cars were not sitting there when my ancestor was christened in 1876, but still to see the actual location where he was christened, I don't know, that just touches my heart somehow. Um, so I would say if you've got those timeline, you know, if there's enough information that you've got a timeline showing up over there because again, it just draws it from the details page. So any information you see over here, you can actually go to the satellite view and see what that place looks like today and even get an idea of what it looked like a long time ago. A lot of those buildings, especially in certain countries of the world, are the same, like the same church that existed when that person lived there. Now quickly to the sources subpage. That's a place where you can manage sources for this person. You can add sources from, uh, it just pops up a little box where you can add them manually or you can attach from them from your source box. You can reorder them and there's some other cool features but again the purpose is not to go into the source subpage in great detail so please see adding sources to the family tree webinar if you're interested in more detail about the source page, the source subpage, I should say. Okay, now we are to the collaborate page. So for this particular person, we see the two sections here. We've got notes and we've got discussions. And I shouldn't say for this particular person, actually notes and discussions show up for everybody on the collaborate page. It's just for Henrietta, she's got some information here. If nothing shows up in notes or discussions, you can click the add a new one or add a, add a new no note or add a new discussion. So this is a great place to add information in notes that doesn't fit well anyplace else. And then discussions is a, basically a mini forum for us to talk about research. So you can, if you see some information on the page, for instance, that's incorrect, you can uh, ask some questions there. Like, does anybody know why this says this? Because the source says something else or whatever. So that's a great place to communicate with other users. 
And then finally, we've got the Memories subpage, which is used to manage artifacts like photos, stories, documents, and auto re audio recordings. Currently, videos cannot be uploaded to this page. Maybe we'll get that, that functionality in the future, but it, it is not available now. And of course, we've got, I believe there are several, whoops, let me go back there. I believe there are several videos on memories, so you could search for those on the YouTube channel and uh, see if you can find something that uh, gives you the detail that you're looking for here. Okay, now we are ready to look at the different parts of the, per the details subpage. Uh, the first one at the top of the page is the, is the life sketch, and that's used for a brief biography, a maximum of 10,000 characters. If you're like me, the 10,000 characters doesn't really help me that much. So using the assumption that most words are about, or an average is about five characters per word, we end up with five characters per word, we end up with about 1,500 words. And an average paragraph is anything from maybe 100 words to 150 words. So you've, this is actually a pretty decent size. You can add quite a few paragraphs here as a life sketch for your person. So what is the benefit of doing a life sketch? Well, there's a couple of benefits. Because the life sketch is first at the top of the page, if you put some information there, it could help prevent a bad merge. And then also, I wanted to point out that it's not a place to send messages, rude or otherwise, to other users. And the reason I say that is I ran across one line in Family Tree where the user had put uh, in capital letters, a warning telling people that they should not dare to change that page as if that, that user owned it. And of course, that's not really the purpose of the life sketch. And it's not, also not really appropriate because family searches or family tree, excuse me, is open edit. It's a place where all of us are, are supposed to be able to contribute to any person. So use the life sketch as a place to provide a short biography for that person that will be helpful to other users. And I really have found that useful as I've come to, peer, to a different person's page and I read the life sketch. It's just kind of cool to find out, you know, where were they born and what was their life like and who was their family and so forth. And it's really, because it's so short, it's really quick to read. And oftentimes you may be saying, well, I don't know, you know, this is an ancestor that I don't know that much about, but you'd be surprised at how much information you can get from sources. So you can go over to that page and maybe look at all the censuses, find out what they did for an occupation and where they lived, and then maybe look up where they lived uh, in Wikipedia and find out more about it. What were the major industries? What was life like for people there? And from those things that you find in the sources, you can actually write a pretty decent life sketch. The next section on the page is the vital section, and this contains basically four pieces of information. It contains the name, the sex, birth-related information, which can include christening. Normally, the christening is very close to the birth. And then also death information, which can include burial information. Right under Life Sketch and Vitals, you've got the Other Information section. So this is where you can add information about, for instance, occupations or military records, that military service, that type of thing. Right below those three sections is the Family Members section. And as the, the name indicates, this is where you can display family relationships. This tends to be a confusing view for a lot of new people, I've noticed, for new users. So I wanted to take a second and just point out what exactly we're looking at here. On the left side, the person whose page we're on is shown in the capacity of a husband and father. Now, of course, if there are no spouse or children for that person in family tree, then there wouldn't be anything here. But that person would still show on the left so that you could add those if applicable. 
then on the right side of the page, you're seeing that person again, but you're seeing them in the context of their birth family. So it shows them with their parents and also with their siblings. The way that you can tell that you're looking at the same person in both the on both the left side and the right side is that their name is in bold dark in, as opposed to being in a, the, a lighter font in blue like everybody else is. So that indicates that this is the person whose page you're on and also that these two entries right here really are for the same person. And I've had people be confused about that saying, well, I, I see what I'm looking for for on the left side of the page, but what's going on over here on the right? Why is this person showing up this way? So I just wanted to point that out, that it's just two different contexts. Here as the head of the household, if they have a spouse and kid, child or children, and here as a child in their birth family. So I hope that makes sense. The, the function to display a summary card is available in this section, and that's really useful both if you want to see a, a quick summary of that person and if you want to navigate to that person's person page. You can click either their name or person, or if you want to navigate to them in tree view, you can click tree. So that's a handy feature to be able to click any name on this page, including the name of the person whose page you're on and just see that quick summary. Now I wanted to talk about a few of the general features that are available in pretty much every section of the details subpage. The first one is, notice these little triangles. Suppose that you wanted to close the live sketch and close the vitals because you wanted to see the family member section without scrolling too much. Then you would click these arrows and it would collapse those sections so they would just become a very thin bar on the page page and the, the triangle would turn sideways. So when you were ready to expand them again, you would just click the triangle again. Any, any place that you see an add button, it means that no information of this type has yet been added. So you can go ahead and click add to add the information. When you do, you get a, a form that is specific to whatever you clicked on. So because I clicked live sketch in this case, I get a form for writing a live sketch. If I had clicked maybe add a burial, I would have gotten a form that would have allowed me to add burial information. If information has already been added, then you don't get an add button, but instead you get an edit button. So you can click edit and again what you see depends on the type of information you're editing. So here because I chose edit name then I get the form where I can edit the name and also I can add a reason statement if I would like to. The way that you add and edit information down in the family member section is slightly different than in the other three sections of the, per, the details subpage. It is done by clicking this little pencil icon and I know, don't know if you can tell that that's what it is because it's a little bit hard to see on the, this size of screen but it is a little pencil icon and when you click it, so I'm going to click the one next to marriage right here. And when I do, I get this flyout that allows me to edit the information for the marriage. So I can edit information about this spouse. For instance, I can remove or replace the spouse. And I can also add marriage events down here in this section. And then other things down the page. Although, I've noticed that for sources, a lot of people don't look on this flyout for sources. So honestly, I tend to put them, or I shouldn't say tend to, I do put them on the regular source subpage. It could possibly be ideal to add them in both places, but uh, just be aware that I probably wouldn't only add them in this place just because this isn't where a lot of people look for sources. And you can also look, you can also, you can kind of just barely see at the bottom here, you can add notes about this relationship. If you want to edit parent or child information, 
the process is very similar. You just go ahead and click this pencil icon next to the child whose relationship you want to edit, and then you come up with a very similar screen. So you can either remove or replace the dad, remove or replace the mom if they are incorrect, or if both are incorrect, then you click this remove or replace and it allows you to do both parents at the same time. And then again, we've got the sources down here and the relationship notes. How do you add family members? You've got add buttons. The important thing to remember on this page is that adding is done from the perspective of the person whose page you're on. And sometimes that could be a little confusing because here, for instance, you might think you're adding a parent for James Bescoby, but you're not actually. You're adding a parent for John William Bescoby, the person whose page you're on. So for instance, this if suppose that you had birth parents and adoptive parents and you wanted to add the adoptive parents for John William Bescoby, you would do that with this add parent button. You can add a sibling for John. You can add a child for John if, if with a mother that's unknown. You can add a child. Oops, I should have put a red thing around that. Sorry, I missed that one. So you can add a child to this couple and then you can also add another spouse for John William Bescoby. The last thing I wanted to talk about today is the resource panel off to the right hand side of the page. And again, we're not going to go into a lot of detail on these features. We'll save that for other webinars, some which exist already and some which we're going to add. But I did want to point out the five main portions of the resource panel and highlight a couple of the ones that are that are used most often. The first section is the research help section, and this is an awesome place that will give you suggestions to help you improve the informa information on this person's page. So for instance, this page shows some research suggestions. Often those are things like, there's a big gap between children. You might want to look for another, ch for another child or um, other things. It's done programmatically based on the information on this page, so they look for gaps between children or missing information, that type of thing. And you can see here the number tells you how many research suggestions there are. Other things that I've seen show up here are suggestions for adding sources, and that has a little blue icon. So basically that's Family Tree's way of saying, hey, we've found a family search historical record that we think applies to this person based on the, the information on the, the person's page. Another thing I've seen show up in this box are data errors, and those are basically logical errors, such as a child born before its mother, or a parent having a baby when they're two, things that just can't happen. So they point those out so that you're able to look into those and get those problems fixed. The next section in the resource panel is search records, and this, I think, is one of the best kept secrets of the, the person page. I love this and use it all the time, and that is that if you click any of these logos except Ancestry Institution, talk about that in a minute, but if you click uh, family search, ancestry, find my past, or my heritage, Family Tree takes the information on the person page and runs a search for you in, on these websites. So it's actually the fastest, easiest way to search because otherwise, if you, for instance, if I just go to Ancestry on a different tab, I have to type in all that, that information for John William Bescoby. Whereas if I just click the Ancestry logo, it runs that search for me using the information on the page, the person page, and I don't have to type it in. So that is way cool. And it's the same for the rest of them. Family search, searches family search historical records. Find my past, searches that website, my heritage, etc. The exception here is Ancestry Institution. This has just been added, and this is useful if you're in a family history center or you are in a family search library. If you are, 
they will always have a, a subscription to Ancestry Institution and you'll be able to click that and run the search in Ancestry Institution and this is useful if you don't have a subscription to Ancestry and you'd like to search it while you're in the Family History Center or the Family Search Library but if you click this from home you will not be able to use it most likely because it's going to ask you for the institution sign-in and I I'm guessing that most of us don't have that to use at home. So the, your most value is going to come from the top two and the bottom two. Uh, just again, saving you retyping all the information for searching. I honestly will, instead of going straight to Ancestry, if I know the person's in Family Tree, I will go to their person page and initiate the search from here just because it's so much faster and more accurate, at least for me. I know it's going to, you know, I don't have to worry, did I make a typo or did I remember the information correctly? I just let Family Tree do the work for me. The next part of the resource panel is the latest changes. The three latest changes are shown here. And then if you click show all, you go into what we call the change log. And that shows all the changes that have been made to this person since the person was added to Family Tree. It doesn't show any changes that were made in New Family Search or previous systems. And because the um, change log deserves a webinar of its own, it actually has one. So if you're interested in learning more about the change log, just go to Mysteries of the Change Log Revealed. And again, we'll show you a list of all these recommended webinars at the end of this one. Okay, the next part is the tools section. And I just wanted to point out two things here. This is where I mentioned we talk more about labels. If you want to add a label to a person or see what labels are available, just click Edit Labels and you'll get that list of predefined labels that are supplied by FamilySearch. And then I also wanted to mention the possible duplicates here. They have recently added, again recently in terms of the date this webinar was recorded, which is October 2018, recently added this little count of possible duplicates. So I can see here that the system did not find any possible duplicates for John William, well, John William Bescoby. It's important to point out, though, that that doesn't mean there aren't duplicates in the system. Possible duplicates finds duplicates that have a lot of information in common with what's over here in the details subpage. But as you know, there can be a duplicate page in the system or duplicate person in the system that doesn't have a lot of information in common. I'll give you an example. Suppose we had a record for John William Bescoby that only listed his parents. No spouse, no siblings, no children. Then suppose we had another record for John William Bescoby that only listed his wife. No children, no siblings, no parents. To Family Tree, those records have almost no information in common. Sure, they have the name in common, but if it's completely different family relationships, they may not show up as a duplicate, even though you, as a researcher, could find the information to show that they are duplicates by looking in historical records. So just because it says zero duplicates doesn't mean that there aren't duplicates. And that's why it's important to uh, know your family and know the family relationships so that you can recognize those duplicates in Family Tree. And again, duplicates is another topic that this one actually deserves two webinars. So we'll be giving you links to both those webinars just in a, in a minute or two because we are just about done here. So the last option here in the resource panel is the print uh, option, and this just allows you to print uh, specific things from based on this person's page that you're on. So you can print their pedigree in landscape style. You can print their portrait pedigree with any portraits that are in Family Tree. You can print the fan chart. And it's worth pointing out here that the fan chart actually prints with more generations than you can see at a time in the fan chart view. So if you love the fan chart like I do, this is a really great 
thing to be aware of that if you want to see more generations at a time, go ahead and use the print feature instead. The disadvantage there is that you can't actually navigate on the print feature. It's going to show you a PDF, and there, but the links aren't active in the PDF. But if you want to print it out, that's kind of cool to know that you can see more generations. And then the last two are family group sheets. You can print a family group sheet without sources and a family group sheet with sources. So here is the promised list of webinars that we've mentioned in this webinar. Uh, you may find those interesting, interesting too. You may find those interesting if you would like more information on any of these topics. There are basically three ways to find these webinars to view them. You can go to the BYU Family History Library webinar page. You can Google F BYU FHL webinars, which honestly, that's usually what I do. And then also you can search, I'm just a Google girl, so you can also search on YouTube and those uh, option, or the videos will show up there. And then also I wanted to mention a couple of Help Center knowledge articles that uh, may be helpful to you with to, to give you more information on some of the topics we've talked about today. So three of them are the Research Help Box, which will go into more detail about that first box on the resource panel, and then also limits to the data about persons in family tree and labels on the person page, that, that little label function where you can add kind of a tag about that tells you more about that person. So that brings us to the end of our webinar today. And thank you, everybody, for being with us. Maren, do we have any questions that we need to answer? Um, right now, um, Ginny asks, could you show the video names again? Um, and Terrell Mills asked, um, can you print the family group sheets without temple information? Oh my goodness, that's a good question, and I do not know the answer to that. If anybody on this webinar knows the answer, could you please put it in the chat box? And in the meanwhile, do we have any other questions? Um, I don't see any. Okay. Um, I, can I throw out a question? I kept hearing a chime during the webinar, and I would like to know, did you users hear that chime as well? Or I should say listeners, sorry, I'm used to like writing software documentation. So I should say, did any of the listeners hear that chime as well? Uh, the chime just indicates for the hosts um, when people come in and when people leave. So, oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I can turn that off if you like, Catherine. Yeah, for me, that would probably be good. So thank you. I was just curious about that. Okay. Um, are you seeing in the chat box or would you like me to read... Um, the comments. Um, oh, good question. I, okay, I didn't even have the chat box open. Let me go ahead and open it up. Okay, so Donna says she did not hear the chime. That's good to know. And great. Thank you. Okay, Christine, thank you so much. You answered our question. You can go to settings, preferences, take and take off showing temple ordinances, and then they will not print on your family group sheet. And also, when you do that, I know that they don't show on the um, the summary card as well and other places where they normally would show up. So that's good to know that they don't show on the pet, the family group sheets. Thank you, Christine. It looks like someone uh, asked, is there an easy way to print the timelines? You know, with this being a new feature, I have not even tried that. That's a really good question. Do you know what? I'll do what I've offered to do on other webinars, and that is that I'll find out, and then I will post an answer in the comments on the YouTube page. Now, one thing that's interesting about that is I've had a number of people email me and say, I, I, did you find the answer to this? I don't see it on the YouTube page. And it's not exactly intuitive because they sometimes, if they're there's more than just one or two comments, they'll hide them. And so you have to click on 
the little box at the top that says something like show comments or order comments or something and you have to pick one of the options and then it will refresh the comments. I've not been able to refresh the comments in a different way than that. So if anybody knows another way to do that, please let us know in the chat box. But otherwise, just look for that button above the comments and you have to click it. And I think it's like something something like show newest comments first or whatever. And when I do that, then I can see the comments. So I promise I will post the answer to printing to whether you can print the timeline on the YouTube comments and just know that's how you can see it if you go there and you don't see it. Um, and if you'd like, I can post those on the website as well under this video. Um, Catherine can just email me whatever she finds and we can put that um, with the video on the website as well. Oh, Marin, that would be awesome. Thank you. I'll, me I'll be sure to copy you on that information. Yeah, that way it'll be easier to find. If you can find the video on the website, then um, any information related to that will be posted um, there as well. So um, all of these links to these videos um, will be included in the post with a video on our website. Oh, that's awesome. And then Georgia, Georgianne, I hope I'm saying your name correctly to answer your question. Marin generally tries to post these videos the day after. So you can look for those tomorrow, right Marin? Did I remember that correctly? Yes, um, so by the latest, it will be posted Monday. Um, I try to get it done on Friday, but I am a college student, so um, I appreciate everyone's patience. Okay, I'm reading Donna's. It was mentioned that sources can be added. Is there a search? No, do you know what? the? Um, from that, from the sources subpage, that's something I'd noticed as well, Donna, if I'm understanding you right. When you're on the sources subpage, you can't run that search, that logo search, or the, um, what am I thinking, the, the uh, search in the research help box, because those don't show when you're on the sources subpage. So you actually have to go back to the details subpage to run those searches. But then once you do, for instance, in the research help box at the top, if you click one of those source links and it turns out to be for your person, it te just takes you straight to the source linker and then you can add them there and they will show up in the, the sources subpage. Janice, I see your question about ordering the sources. You, uh, as far as I can tell, I can still order them. I've been able to drag them. It looks like they've taken away the ability to use the little arrows that were on the right hand side, but I've been able to drag them to a different order. So, and no search in the main sources page that you get to from Let's see, that you get to from clicking under your name. Oh, okay, I know, you're, I think you're talking about the source box, Donna. So I, I'm, I actually don't know the answer. I love this chat ability, this is really cool. Yeah, so uh, Jana says they've hidden that feature. Janet, do you want to comment a little bit more about that? Like what do, what do users need to do since that feature is hidden? Oh, okay, great. So if you're wanting, you're talking about reordering the sources and you can just click on the line and drag it to reorder it. Thanks. Appreciate that. Have we answered everybody's questions or does anybody have any other questions? All right. It looks like it's all the questions we have for right now. I will just move over to the closing screen just to remind everyone of the upcoming announcements. So next week's webinar will be next Thursday on the 25th at 4 p.m. And that will be with Joe Everett. Joe is the head librarian at the Family History Library. Uh, and I'll zoom in really quick on the upcoming schedule for November. So this schedule 
will be posted in the next week, I believe, on our website. But we have an upcoming webinar with Paul Woodbury. Uh, he'll be presenting on DNA. And then we have a webinar with James Tanner and another one with Catherine. And then we'll be having a webinar with Jean Nasbitt. And the topic hasn't been decided yet, but we'll send an email when that gets updated. And just like Catherine said, a recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube page and on our website. Um, and if you aren't already uh, following our social media channels, um, we also update things on there as well if you're interested in that. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu. And we hope that you have a wonderful weekend and hope to see you next Thursday.